Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh, let me give you a little game plan here, uh, particularly if you're new with us. We've been making our way through the whole Bible. We started with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We're going through Revelation chapter 22. Um, I, I can't plan exactly how long it's going to take us to get to Revelation, but we're only a few weeks away. In the meantime, it just worked out this way that the epistle lections for the next six weeks come from the book of Revelation. Uh, so I'm preaching this whole year, as you know, from the epistle section of the Bible and lections appropriate uh, to the, the, the Sunday after Sunday. And here we are today with Pentecost and the next six Sundays come from Revelation. These are the six passages out of the 22 chapters that scholars believe are the most significant passages. Now, that doesn't mean you and I will not deal with every verse and chapter. We will. We definitely will. But for the preaching, we're going to deal with these six great texts. So I'm encouraging everybody who will, of course, to come to worship with us. The four Sundays in June, the first two weeks in July, we'll be dealing with these six passages, the six greatest texts in Revelation. And then we should be just about at the point that we can say to anybody in the congregation, if you didn't get all you wanted about Revelation, if you didn't hear the, the questions answered that you have about this book, then come and be with us. We're going to do verse by verse and chapter by chapter through the whole 22 chapters. So that's the plan anyway. I didn't, uh, didn't know exactly when in the class we would get to Revelation, but it looked like it's going to work out just about right for us to be getting there uh, right at the time the sermon series ends. Uh, we still have... Three chapters here in Second Peter. That won't take us very long. Then we have three very brief little letters, First, Second, Third John. We have Jude, which is very, very short. And then we're right into Revelation. So I think this is all going to work out just about right that we finish the preaching series and get right into the Bible study at that point. Uh, for this letter, I told you that we're going to use the work of Dr. Dwayne Watson. And Dr. Watson is a Quaker. As we've gone through the Bible this second time together, I've tried to get as much variety as I can while still being sure that we have scholars who teach the Bible the way you and I understand it. So Dr. Dwayne Watson is, is going to be uh, very much in the line of scholarship that the best of our Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Roman Catholics, Lutherans, and so on would be. Um, he is an acknowledged scholar. And uh, we will... But, but, there are always little nuances there between a woman scholar and a male scholar. And there are nuances here between a Quaker and an Episcopalian. So I thought you might enjoy uh, my going through this commentary with you. And what I've done, of course, is to read the whole thing and highlighted just the sentences that I think are necessary to help you understand each passage as we get to it. All right, let's pray. God, we turn our attention to your book. We believe it is your book that you found a way to inspire into the hearts and minds of faithful people things that you wanted later people to know about you and about each other. Uh, we're looking for those things that are forever true, acknowledging that people who wrote the Bible were often limited by their own time and place, often conditioned by the circumstances into which they were born and into which they lived their whole lives. So we're trying to separate out those things that were culturally inspired, peculiar to another time and place, and those things that are universally and forever true. We pray that Dr. Watson and other great scholars will help us do that. And we offer our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, if you're new with us, let me uh, bring you up to date very quickly on where we left off last Sunday. We had just gone through the introduction that Dr. Watson did for us. And he reminds us that this second letter of Peter is almost surely not written by Simon Peter, one of the first twelve disciples of our Lord. Uh, that fisherman who lived at a little place called Capernaum, and I hope you get to go there someday. I'm still planning uh, to have a trip to Israel uh, before I retire. I uh, haven't set a, a firm date for that yet, but I'm thinking about it and planning for it. Uh, I will give you a date and plenty of time for you to schedule. Uh, some months in advance, I will certainly let you know about that. 
if you've not been before or if you have, and if you want to go this time, I'll do my very best to help you uh, have a really good time in this all-significant Bible land of ours. Capernaum is a small t- was a small town uh, on the Sea of Galilee, which we know as a freshwater lake. Capernaum was almost right at the 12 o'clock part of the clock. So if you can envision the face of a clock, Capernaum's right up at the top. Uh, at the 9 o'clock position is the town of Tiberias, and Tiberias is a sister city to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, our mayors for 20 years or so have made occasional trips to Tiberias, and the mayor of Tiberias has been here on more than one occasion. Um, Capernaum lay in ruins and gradually was covered over by the blowing dust and sand. And then since World War II, when the Roman Catholics were able to get title to that property, they bought it, um, they have been doing really good digging at Capernaum. And the very first time we went back in 1983, so it's been 26 years ago already, our first trip, uh, Capernaum uh, had marble uh, columns and things sort of strewn around, lying around. Uh, But the Catholics have kept digging. And as they've had money, have kept digging and, and kept putting back together this ancient little town of Capernaum. Uh, They believe they found the home of Simon Peter. And uh, good scholarship shows that they may well be right about that. Uh, They've maintained the ruins of this house where they they dug down and and the foundations and so on that they found. And then they've sort of built up over it an, an observatory so that you can look down into it without disturbing The synagogue, they've put the columns back up into place so that you have a real sense of what that old synagogue looked like. On one of our trips, uh, some of you were traveling with us when we got to Capernaum, and we told we'd have to wait just a moment for Charlton Heston to move out of the way so we could see it. He was there taping that series that he did where he read the Bible, and he happened to be at Capernaum at the very same day we were there. Okay, Simon and his brother Andrew, uh, the brothers Peter and John, sons of Zebedee, all lived in Capernaum. Jesus' hometown, Nazareth, is about 15, 16 miles away. Uh, But he came to Capernaum and started calling disciples, and Simon was one of those. So we believe that Simon's native tongue was Aramaic, as was Jesus' native tongue. And uh, that when Jesus spoke and the gospel writers uh, put down exactly what he said, they put expressions in Aramaic. Um, so these letters, First and Second Peter, are written in a much more sophisticated Greek that scholars simply believe Peter would not have known. Now it's possible that he could have been dictating and someone writing into uh, Greek. That's possible. Uh, but scholars, again, mainline, long-standing seminaries, the professors of those fully accredited believe that these two letters were written by two different authors. Uh, When you feed the vocabulary into computers and so on, you find that they are not the same working vocabularies, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. Probably neither written by Simon himself. Probably not even dictated by Peter during his lifetime. Probably written a good generation or so after Peter was put to death in the persecutions of Nero in the mid-60s in Rome. Okay. Most scholars believe this uh, writing occurred probably between about 90 and 100. All right. Uh, we can prove that. So you can, you know, you, you, you can hear the, the old uh, fisherman himself in these words, and that's fine. Or someone to whom he was dictating, and that's fine. Or you may uh, agree with Dr. Watson and most of our other scholars that it was probably written a generation later by someone who may have known Peter, may have known him, may have loved and admired him so very much in is writing into a new situation what they believe Simon would have said had he lived into that situation. All right, let's get underway and read just the first two verses to start. Notice here the very first word is spelled rather strangely, and Dr. Watson will comment on that. Our translation says, Simeon, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith as precious as ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Okay, we'll turn to Dr. Watson and let him help us here with these first couple of verses. 
the epistle of Second Peter begins with identification of the sender and the addressee and a greeting that originated in the Jewish wish for peace or shalom and prosperity for the recipients. The author is identified in the New Revised Standard Version as Simeon, a less typical Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word Simon. So, neither of these words, Simon nor Simeon, is a Greek word. Uh, They both are Hebrew words. uh, That someone is trying to write a Hebrew word with a Greek vocabulary. uh, uh, Alphabet, I should say. Alphabet. Okay? Now, you know how, how this happens even today. When you travel country by country in Europe, you discover that what the natives call their cities are not what we call them. Okay. Um, we call one of the most beautiful cities in Italy, Florence. They call it Florenza. Okay. We say Milan. They say Milano. And then we say Rome. No, Roma, and so on. Uh, in Germany, they have München. We call it Munich. So on. All right. So uh, we know that the Hebrew name was Simon. Anybody remember what the Aramaic name for that fisherman was? Doesn't sound at all like Simon. Cephas. Cephas. So sometimes he was called Cephas, his Aramaic name. Sometimes by the Hebrew, Simon. Sometimes. As it's transliterated into Greek, Simon or Simeon. And that's what he's trying to point out here. The author is identified theologically as a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Servant, you recall, comes from the Greek word doulos. And it's a title for any Christian as one whom Christ has redeemed, that is, bought out of slavery to sin and death, And because he bought us, so to speak, we become his servant, his slave. We want to do things his way. The recipients of the letter are given the theological identification as those who have received a faith as precious as ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. The last phrase, Savior Jesus Christ, can also be translated of God and of Jesus our Lord, a rendering which does not call Jesus himself God. It's rare to find Jesus actually called God in the New Testament. God was present in him, uh, but he is almost never simply called God. Um, Okay, let me look with you just a second more beyond what Dr. Watson has written here. Look at the second part of verse 1. The word righteousness is a key word, dikaiosune in Greek, and remember it means right standing. Okay, faith has as a synonym in English, trust. Okay, so this letter is addressed to those who have received a faith or trust as precious as ours, the author calls his, through the right standing of our God. Now, notice here, there's only one way that we stand right with God. Just one. That is to trust That we have the goodwill of God. That we have the favor of God. That God wants good to come to us. There's nothing we can do, have done, nor can ever do to set ourselves right with God except receive His gift. He offers us right standing. He says, you've never done anything I'm not willing to forgive if you really want to be turned and sin in a different direction. Repent in Hebrew has to do with turning. So not just being sorry for something you've done or all the things you've done, but being willing to be turned and sent in a new and right direction. That's God's gift to you. If you have received that gift, then that's called faith or trust. So it's made possible by God, which you and I have come to know, best of all, clearest of all, most authentically, in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the name of Mary's baby. Christos, the Greek word for Messiah. It's an equivalent to Messiah. It means exactly the same. So, a lot caught up in those few words. Very significant words. And shalom again means well-being. So, it's not just absence of hostility. It's very practical in Hebrew. 
If you need food, we want you to have food. If you're thirsty, we want you to have something to drink. Uh, we want you to have a good place to sleep at night and so on. Shalom involves a lot of different things. Okay, let's go on. We're going to read now verses 3 through 11. His divine power and his, this pronoun, has as an antecedent, you can see immediately above it, God and Jesus our Lord. Remember, Lord here uh, is the word kurios in Greek. Uh, we have it in the mosaic in the south end of the great hall here. As we have in gold letters the name of God given to Moses at the burning bush, in the south end we have the equivalent in Greek, uh, saying for us Christians, we believe the same one who was present to Moses in the form of a burning bush was indeed present for all the world in Mary's child, Jesus. Same stuff. I am who I am. I am bread. I am wine. I am life. I am uh, truth and so on. Same one. All right. This one, his divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus, he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that's in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness. Here again, you hear always trust and obey. We'll be singing in July. If you trust God, then you're supposed to do what God tells you. If you trust that God does love you, is willing to set you right with him, then surely this gracious God ought to be the one who's directing your every action from that point on. So, uh, you you are supposed to support your faith now with doing good, doing the things that are right. Right. And goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with agape, love, willingness to put yourself out for the well-being of another. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfaithful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For anyone who lacks these things is short-sighted and blind and is forgetful of the cleansing of past sins. That is, if you know you've been forgiven, it ought to make a difference in the way you behave forever after. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to confirm your call and election. For if you do this, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. Okay, Let's see what Dr. Watson can say for us here. And here again, just to remind you, I read a whole page like this and I've got maybe five or six sentences. I think I've, I've highlighted what's necessary for your understanding. Verse 3, it is through Christ's power, power that he shares with God, of course, that Christians have everything needed to live a godly life. Let's go back to this word power. Those of you who have been with me all these years know what it means, what the word is. It's the word dunamis, from which we get in English dynamite, dynamic, dynamo, and so on. In the noun, it means power. In the verb, it means to be able. If you have power, then you are able. So the noun and verb are very closely tied together. Luke, perhaps more than any other writer in the New Testament, in his book of Luke and the book of Acts, you know he wrote them both, says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, today's Pentecost, uh, the Holy Spirit had always been, but it came with a new breath, a new freshness, a new power, Luke says, on the day of Pentecost. Okay, so power is very much a part of of, 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 of this author's work as well. Okay. Um, it is through Christ's power, power that he shares with God, that Christians have everything needed to live a godly life. All right, let's go on. This gift of possessing everything necessary for a godly life comes with the personal knowledge of Jesus Christ obtained at conversion. That, that Jesus Christ came, was sent for you. Not only you, 
but for you. For you too. So Christians can look forward to the fulfillment of the promises of Christ. Elsewhere in this letter, the promises are eschatological, that is, about the end time, and refer to the perusia when Jesus comes back again. Thus, Christians are saved from the destruction reserved for the corrupted world. The benefits afforded Christians by divine power through their knowledge of Jesus Christ enable them, see how the, the verb uh, manifests itself, if you have power, you've been enabled to live godly lives and to be blessed with the promise of immortality. Lists of virtues and vices were quite popular in the New Testament. Paul uh, strings them together from time to time, and this author does here. If you do this, it leads to this good thing, and this good thing leads to that good thing, and that good thing leads to another good thing, and so on. Uh, Faith, being first in this list, is the grounding of all the other virtues. Start with believing that God loves you, wants good to come to you, is willing to set past aside and behind to erase it and give you a new beginning. Since love, and that's agape here, the chief virtue in such lists of Christian virtues concludes the list. It ultimately includes all the other virtues as well. So what Dr. Watson is saying is the list starts, you know, with faith and it ends with love. And Paul does the same. The three greatest gifts of the Spirit are faith, hope, and love. He has faith at the beginning, love at the end. So does this author, even though Paul is not that author. So goodness, virtue, knowledge, self-control, endurance, perseverance, godliness. This, these things are possible for people who honor God who acknowledge God's authority and obey the will of God. When he says mutual affection here, he means affection for other Christians, seen now as brothers and sisters in Christ. Call and election are synonymous terms for Christ's summons of the Christian to repent, to be saved, to serve God in accomplishing God's purposes, and to enter into the kingdom and partake of its blessings. Now, let me stop just a second here because these words are not always understood. Call and election. Uh, Paul is very clear in his writings that faith itself is a gift of God. Um, If you have been able, see again that verb, if you've been enabled to come to faith, it's a gift of God. Not everybody gets it. They just don't get it. They don't hear it. They don't see it. They don't envision it. That one who flung these billions of stars out into space or created a giant explosion, our scientists believe. And the most recent thing I read said we're down to a number of about 13.8 billion years ago when this big explosion took place. That that one knows every person. Jesus said knows you well enough to know how many hairs you have on your head. Knows what's going on so completely that not one sparrow, the cheapest little bit of protein you could buy in the market of Jesus' time, two little pennies for a sparrow, not even one of them falls to the ground but that God knows and cares. That's what Jesus said. Now if you hear that, I mean really hear it, and accept it as being so. That's a gift of God. So faith is not something you and I just do. If we have it, if we trust that these things are true for us, that itself, those, uh, that faith itself is a gift of God. Verse 11 holds out the ultimate hope of every Christian, and that is entrance into the eternal kingdom. Mr. Wesley said, I want to be known as a man of one book, the Bible. And I count on that book to lead me to heaven, he said. Although Christians must expend effort in their spiritual lives, I mean, once we've accepted God's gift, it comes down to hard work, wanting good to come to all these other children of God and helping it come to them whenever possible. Salvation and all that is needed to grow spiritually remain gifts of God. Keep receiving the gifts of God. Okay, let's read on. Verses 12 through 15. Therefore, I intend to keep on reminding you of these things, though you know them already 
and are established in the truth that has come to you, I think it right as long as I'm in this body to refresh, refresh your memory, since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. Jesus said a similar thing himself in John 15. I will pray to the Father. He will send you a paraclete, comforter, the King James said, counselor, advocate, who will remind you of all these things I've told you. The Holy Spirit will remind you of all these things I've told you and teach you new things as you go along. Okay, let's see what Dr. Watson has here. The reason for writing the epistle called Second Peter is to re- provide a reminder of what the apostles had taught while those first ones were still living. The Testament allows the author to use Peter's apostolic authority and teaching to address the situation of false teachers in his own time, as though Peter himself were speaking into the future, a future that is the present of the author and the letter's recipients. Okay, simply, uh, he and those who receive his letter are living in a different time and place, but what would Peter have said to them had he been allowed to live and write a letter. So, these churches who receive the letter know the tradition of which they're being reminded. The author understands this truth as the message that Peter, Paul, and all the apostles preached. Peter is portrayed here as being about to die, when in fact uh, we believe he already had died by the time the letter got written. Okay, let's uh, read through the end of chapter 1. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. What would that occasion have been? What do we call it? Yeah, the Mount of Transfiguration. Exactly, the Mount of Transfiguration. That one day Jesus took a little higher up the mountain, those three who seemed to be closest of all to him, Peter, James, and John. Don't know why old Andrew got left out on that. He was a brother of Peter. But Jesus took the other three. (coughs) <coughs> from Capernaum, Peter, James, and John. And they went up a little bit farther. And while they were up higher there on the mountain, they saw, transfigured before them, Moses. Remember? Moses. And that Jesus was revealed to them as exceeding Moses. Remember, if you ask the rabbis here in Tulsa, our dear friends, Who is the clearest revealer ever of God? And they will say Moses. They don't say that God was in Moses the way we say God was in Jesus, but that Moses the man was the clearest revealer and that he is the the heart, if you would, of the Torah. You have a lot of other people mentioned, but nobody except God gets as much space in the first five scrolls as Moses does. It was to Moses that God came at the burning bush. It was to Moses that God spoke the word to go back to Egypt. He was ready to free his people. It was back again on that same mountain that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And so on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Gospel writers are telling you and me that we are told at that point, the followers of Jesus are told, this one exceeds Moses. This one will be your authentic revealer. Listen to him. Those are the words on the Mount of Transfiguration. Listen to him. This is the one. Okay, so this this author is picking up on that very thing. Um, Verse 19, So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. 
First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Okay? I'm going to tell you what Dr. Watson has to say about that passage, and I want to say just a couple of things. All right, the body of the letter begins with an implicit accusation of the false teachers. Now, perusia was a technical term. It's spelled P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A, perusia, was a technical term for a visit to a city by a ruler or someone they called a god or some other important person to dispense rewards or mete out judgment. Okay, so the word perusia could be used of a ruler in Greece or a ruler in Rome. The Christians took it over to refer to the coming again of Jesus. But in their political systems, first Greeks and then Romans, uh, a ruler could come and announce to a village, well, it's been reported to me that this person, this person, this person have not paid taxes, have plotted against the government, uh, have had meetings in their homes, Uh, trying to overthrow local authorities and so on, and they might crucify them or hang them. There are others in this community, I've been told, have done exceptionally well. Always paid your taxes ahead of time. We're more generous and so on and so forth. Pass out rewards. So the early Christians decided, well, that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. Those who have not kept faith will be so judged And those who have kept faith and have done what he taught us to do will be appropriately rewarded. Okay, that's what he's alluding to here. Um, The false teachers question this doctrine because of the apparent delay of the second coming. Now, if in fact this letter was not written until 90 to 100, somewhere in that decade, then it means that Jesus had already been gone for 60 to 70 years. Long time. First disciples, all dead. None of them would have lived that long, having been adults when Jesus was an adult. Uh, They're all gone. It's a new generation now. And we know that it created real problems in the early church that he didn't come back right away. If you read Paul's letters, he thinks it's next week. Uh, We've we've got to hurry. We don't have time to get married and all that sort of stuff. Uh, he's coming back right away. I mean, that's You have to see Paul's teaching in that understanding that he's just here right away. We, this whole business about celibacy, Paul said, no, no, if you've already got a wife or husband, that's fine. Then everything's fine. But you don't have time to go out and get married now. He's coming next week. It wasn't that people were supposed to be celibate for 70, 80 years. But Paul anticipated his coming back so quickly. And now... 60 to 70 years have passed. He hasn't come back. So there were those who said, well, you didn't understand it. You didn't get it right. And this author, along with others, is writing to say, we did get it right. You have to be patient. You have to be patient. God will rain down history when God chooses to do it. The Perugia hope, the hope of Perugia is not false. It will happen in God's own good time. Okay, the author continues his refutation of those false teachers. Apostolic teaching of the Perusia is dependable because it relies on Old Testament prophecy, he believes. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place. The churches will be ready when the true light of Christ to which prophecy points does in fact come again. The morning star is also the star seen at dawn, heralding approaching daylight. In Revelation, that we'll get to in a few weeks, Jesus is called that morning star. The second accusation of the false teachers is that the Old Testament prophecies upon which the apostles based their teaching of the Perusia came about by the prophet's own interpretation of their dreams and visions, and not by revelation from God. So this author argues that no Old Testament prophecy was a product of human will because the prophets were indeed inspired by the Spirit of God. True prophets do not speak their own words, 
but the Word of God. Okay, a little bit more from Dr. Watson. Often we wonder about the truth of the promised Perusia because God has not acted yet to fulfill that promise and we've been almost 2,000 years from the death of Jesus. Our doubts surface most in times of crisis, yet we can put our trust in the inspired apostolic eyewitness testimony to the transfiguration on the mountain. We can endeavor to live in the light radiated by this small lamp of proclamation until fully radiated by Christ at the time he returns. <clears throat> okay, let me stop just a second. We United Methodists uh, have our own statements about how we come to theological truth, you remember. Uh, here this author says, I don't, don't depend on anybody's interpretation. Uh, critics of mainline churches say that we interpret the Bible. That we're not supposed to interpret the Bible. Uh, just take it for what it says. Um, when I was doing a radio program in Houston every Sunday night for those seven years I was with Dr. Allen, um, I preached every Sunday night at, at uh, 7, and uh, at 8 o'clock the service was over, and I'd rush Gail and the children home, be sure they were locked into the parsonage safely, and then I would go on over to a big 50,000 watt station there in Houston belonging to ABC Network. It was called KXYZ. And I would take telephone calls for the next hour and a half from 9 to 10.30. And the group that gave me more trouble than anybody at first were the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they wouldn't identify themselves as Jehovah's Witnesses, but I could tell by the questions they were asking they were Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, don't salute the flag and don't take blood transfusions and all kinds of things. Uh, and then one time I said to them, okay, you keep saying do not interpret the Scriptures when in fact you interpret the Scriptures. You do interpret the Scriptures. I said, first of all, you say that there's only one name appropriate to God, and that's the name Jehovah. And the truth is, Jehovah was not the name of God. Jehovah is a pretty lousy translation by the King James scholars. If you want to know the name and there's only one, then you have to call him the Eye Asher Eye. So you need to redo your stationery here. You got the wrong name. And the second thing, of course, is that when you talk about how many will be saved, and you have a specific number, and you say that number can never be interpreted, let me tell you what I saw one time. Gail and I were representing the School of Theology at SMU back when I was a student there. I was chosen to represent our School of Theology at a national conference uh, up in, in, uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, while we were there, uh, I said to Gail, we've got a night off here. Let's go see the Milwaukee Braves play baseball. And uh, so we rushed over there, and uh, the parking lot was full, jammed out with cars. And we went running from the car to get in on the last little bit of the ball game. And we got to the ticket gates and the turnstiles, and there was nobody there taking tickets. So I thought, oh, man, it must be so close to over. They've, you know, they've quit taking tickets. So it's not going to cost us anything. Whatever we see here, we can see maybe Henry Aaron, Eddie Matthews, some of these people play. You know, Warren Spawn. So we go running up the ramp, and the stadium is jammed out with Jehovah's Witnesses. They were not having a baseball game. They were having a Jehovah's Witness convention. Uh, I mean, the infield, there were chairs everywhere and a pulpit set up in the middle and so on. Well, the next day when we were trying to get out of Milwaukee, uh, there were so many Jehovah's Witnesses pouring out of town. I mean, every street was jammed with Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said to the people on the radio down there, you know what? There were more people in that stadium that night than you believe are going to be saved. Now, which ones are not going to be saved? You see, everybody interprets. Everybody interprets. They say they don't interpret, but they do interpret, of course. Everybody interprets. And our critics who say, don't interpret the Bible, just take it for what it is, have already made gross mistakes because there are various literary styles used in the Bible. And our best scholars all know that. 
when you go talk to the two rabbis, and it was their faith community that produced those first 39 books, ask them about the first 10 chapters of the Bible. They will both tell you without batting an eye, the first 10 chapters are prehistory. History begins for Jews with Abraham and Sarah. That's when it all starts for them. And all the stories prior to Abraham and Sarah are attempts to describe how things began and ended up at the time of Abraham and Sarah. So they've tried to put everything that happened up until the time of Abraham and Sarah in the first ten chapters so they can get on with Abraham and Sarah in chapter 11. And our rabbis here know that it never meant God created the heavens and the earth in six 24-hour days. It's a poem. Call it a poem if that helps you. Call it a parable if that helps you. It's not trying to describe God's creating everything that is in six 24-hour days. Never. So, those who say don't interpret have already interpreted. They've already decided the first chapter of Genesis is a historical prose exactly the way it happened. And that's never the way it was intended. So, you have to be careful when you, when you read something like Second Peter here and it says, don't interpret. So, how do we Methodists do this? We have a very specific plan here. We say that when we're trying to determine theological truth, we bring four things to the table. Number one is Scripture. I mean, this book is the most important book in the world for us. But number two, tradition. Tradition. I've told you this story uh, about uh, Catholics back when, when they were having Vatican II. Our Dr. Albert Outler from Perkins School of Theology was invited by the Roman Catholics to be a Protestant interpreter. Uh, and Albert Outler was genius quality. I mean, this guy was absolutely amazing. When our Southern Methodist University succeeded in drawing Albert Outler away from Yale Divinity School to come to Dallas, Texas to be a professor, that was a major coup for us. And our seminary really began to pick up. If we could get somebody from Yale, then we could get somebody else from Yale and Princeton and Harvard and so on. Uh, we discovered it came down to money mostly. You know, if you had the money, uh, you know, with these endowed chairs. But Albert Outler was chosen by the Roman Catholics to come to Rome. Uh, this guy knew Latin so well himself that he still has the primary translation of St. Augustine's Confessions from Latin into English. Acknowledged by the Roman Catholic world as much as the Protestant world. I mean, he was that, that brilliant. And he said that one day there was a discussion group where Protestants were invited to be a part. And the Catholics had a very definite opinion and the, and the Protestants a different one. And Albert Outler said he was trying to motion to these Protestants, don't overload yourself here, don't say more than you really know. But finally one of these Protestants sort of burst out and said, well, let's vote. To which a Roman cardinal said, the majority have already voted and they are dead. Okay, what he's saying is, do not ignore 2,000 years of history. Tradition is important. Tradition is important. Look back at the first century. Not all those who wrote got their writings into the Bible, but their writings were often very significant. We have some of those. The second century, writings didn't get into the Bible, but we have some of them. Pay attention. The closer we can get to that historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, the more likely we are to get the real truth of the matter. And so tradition is important. Now, later councils are also important, but the closer you can get to the historical Jesus, the better. Third, reason. Reason. When you write, uh, read, when we come to Revelation, you're going to have to really pay close attention if you're going to get this, because John doesn't know any more about the cosmos than any of the first 65 writers. 
And he still believes the earth is flat and there is water underneath and there's water above and the water underneath has to be kept under constant surveillance because it may just erupt at any time and drown us all, this great abyss down below us and so on. I mean, his understanding of the world is the same as it's been all the way through the Bible. And for us not to understand what he's talking about, I mean, when he gets to the punch right at the end and talks about the sea is no more. The sea was that great abyss, that chaotic power that overtook the world in the time of Noah. That was in the very beginning before God spoke and God moved the darkness and the yucky stuff under the earth is silenced forever. You have to understand how John conceived the world. Okay, for us to pretend that the writers of the Bible had been told by God that the earth is not the center of the universe, that the earth is not the center of our own solar system, that the sun does not go around the earth every 24 hours, is to deceive ourselves. God did not tell them all of those things. Okay? He didn't. He didn't even tell Jesus. The very man of very man Jesus wasn't told either. He was asked, when is God going to do these things? When will God bring the end time? And Jesus said, you got me. That's known only to the Father. Only to the Father. Okay, what I'm saying is, there are preachers in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who use this second letter of Peter to try to beat you and me over the heads and say, look what they do at Boston Avenue. They interpret the Scriptures. And this says, don't interpret the Scriptures. We Methodists believe you start with Scripture and you move to tradition and you move to reason. Don't be afraid of our great universities. Don't be afraid of our great seminaries who've been in business for hundreds of years. Don't be afraid to let our scientists and so on go where they can take us. They aren't going to do away with God for you and me. They aren't. At the end of the day, when they say, okay, this is the way it happened. This is the way human beings came. Whoever, you know, is this the latest uh, missing link you've been hearing about? This new fossil they found? Uh, we'll see. But it certainly is significant. This fossil they found has a different kind of ankle from the others. More like the great apes and the chimpanzees and humans and so on. Well, we'll see. Let the scientists run where they can run. Every few years, they have to correct this a little bit and go in another direction. You've been reading about the repairs to Hubble Telescope. We're counting on Hubble now for another five big years. It's better equipped than it's ever been before. Better lenses, all sorts of things. It's a 100 miles farther out than the space station, you know, to get it out beyond the, the distortion. But, in 2014, if all goes well, we're going to have a telescope three times as great as Hubble. Guess how far it can see. Guess how much it can teach us. Okay, we're not afraid. We are not afraid. We believe in great colleges and universities. Uh, we want people to know and be able to reason as well as possible. Faith doesn't have to be unreasonable. Okay. And then fourth, is experience. It's not number one, two, or three. It's number four. Your own experience. What has God whispered to your deepest heart about what's true and what's not true? About the way the world really moves and the way it does not move and so on. Okay? All these years I've been with you, I hope you've understood what we're trying to tell you about this all-important book. But the way you deal with this book is the reason we have so many different churches. It's even the reason we have different Methodist churches. Because not all Methodists deal with this book exactly the same way. They're supposed to. But they don't always. We had a district superintendent right here in Tulsa a few years ago. Not Mike Chafin. It was before Mike and even before that one. But 
one of the district superintendents since I've been here who stood up at a district preacher's meeting and said, we're supposed to be people of four books. The Bible, the discipline, the hymnal, and the book of worship. I've been in every Methodist church in this district and more than half of you are not paying a proper attention to any of the four. All right, let's go on. Chapter 2. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive opinions. They will even deny the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Even so, many will follow their licentious ways, and because of these teachers, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Their condemnation pronounced against them long ago has not been idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Okay, let's see what Dr. Watson says. And I just have a couple of sentences here. The author turns from refuting the false teacher's accusations against apostolic teaching to counter-accusing them of similar behavior. Rather than the apostles, it's the false teachers who stand in the succession of the false prophets of Israel. The false teachers even deny the master who bought them, redeemed them. Like masters purchased slaves out of slavery in order to set them free, Christ offered His blood as a purchase price to buy sinners from slavery to sin and death to set them free to serve Him. Any master who acted as a patron for a saint in this capacity was due lifetime gratitude and honor. The ethical life that God demands is described with the common Jewish and Christian metaphor of the way a disciplined way of living one's life. Okay, let's go a little farther. Verse 3. Verse 4, sorry. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment, even if He did not spare the ancient world, even though He saved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood on a world of the ungodly? And if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction and made them an example of what is coming to the ungodly? And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, greatly distressed by the licentiousness of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by their lawless deeds that he saw and heard, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge their flesh in depraved lust and who despise authority. This passage is an elaborate one-sentence proof. Did you notice? In Greek, all of those verses, one sentence. For the proposition of verse 3, that the condemnation and destruction of judgment have not been idle or asleep. The proof is based on three Old Testament examples of sinners who were judged. The two examples of destruction by water at the flood and by fire at Sodom and Gomorrah are sometimes linked together in tradition as the two prime examples of divine judgment. He also adds examples of the righteous who were spared judgment. The first example of judgment comes from Jewish tradition about the watchers. The watchers are the angels referred to in Genesis chapter 6, who are portrayed as having had sex with human women. In Jewish tradition, these angels were cast into hell and confined to chains of deepest darkness until judgment because of their sexual sins. Now, hell, in this verse, is literally the Tartarus of Greek mythology. That is, the lowest part of the underworld, where the giants were kept in chains by the Greek gods for their rebellion against them. In Jewish end-time literature, Tartarus became the lowest place in Hades, 
damp and dark, where divine punishment of the wicked was dispensed. The second example of judgment is the flood. And the third example of judgment is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Although Noah's preaching did not change the ways of his neighbors, he was found faithful and was spared the judgment of the flood. His reward was based on his right standing, not on the response of his neighbors when he told them what was about to happen. This is an encouragement, for we are still rewarded for having tried whether people responded appropriately or not. Let's go on. Verse 11. <clears throat> Bold and willful, they are not afraid to slander the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not bring against them a slanderous judgment from the Lord. These people, however, are like irrational animals, more creatures of instinct, born to be caught and killed. They slander what they do not understand. And when these creatures are destroyed, they also will be destroyed, suffering the penalty for doing wrong. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their dissipation while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. They've left the straight road and have gone astray, following the road of Balaam, son of Bosar, who loved the wages of doing wrong, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs, mist driven by a storm. For them the deepest darkness has been reserved. For they speak bombastic nonsense. And with licentious desires of the flesh, they entice people who have just escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For people are slaves to whatever masters them. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overpowered, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment that was passed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog turns back to its own vomit and the sow is washed only to wallow again in the mud. All right. Wonderful, juicy stuff, huh? The author digresses to supply a loosely structured denunciation. The denunciation negatively characterizes the false teachers as ungodly, castigates their doctrine, and alerts the audience to the dire consequences of following that doctrine. The false teachers are called bold, willful, arrogant. The false teachers are probably slandering Evil angels, that's what they are, slandering evil angels. The false teachers have slandered the evil angels as having no power over them. The false t teachers are said to slander those evil angels whom they do not understand. The false teachers will be either destroyed like animals which are intended to be destroyed for food or destroyed like animals with the future judgment by fire. The false teachers, like the evil angels, will be suffering the penalty for doing what is wrong. The false teachers find pleasure to revel or carouse. The false teachers have carried this reveling to their, in their pleasures into the love feasts of the church. Such activity makes the false teachers blots and blemishes, contrary to the desirable state of being without spot or blemish at the perusia when Jesus comes again. The author is angry, of course, and accuses the false teachers of always looking for someone with whom to commit adultery. Another accusation is that the false teachers seduce the unstable. This accusation relies on fishing and snaring with bait as a metaphor for enticing a person to commit some vice. It portrays the false teachers as fishing for the unstable, probably new converts whom they ensnare who don't know enough yet to resist these false prophets. So he accuses the false teachers of having left the straight way, a common metaphor for not obeying God any longer. This accusation is amplified in verses 15-16 with the example of Balaam, who left the straight way because of greed. Bosar, B-O-S-O-R here, is an unattested form of the name Baor, 
and is probably a play on the Hebrew word Besor or flesh, which in effect calls Balaam a son of the flesh. Wages of wickedness refers to the monetary gain that Balaam hoped to receive from Balak for cursing Israel. This is when they're trying to get into the promised land and uh, needing help and uh, a tribe that's not going to help them, but in fact sell them to someone else. Tradition says that Balaam's reward was death by the sword of Israel's army when he was caught with the Midianite tribe. In the text of Numbers 22, the ass alone rebukes Alam Balaam for striking her across the head. Balaam's madness in attempting to curse Israel was refuted by a jackass that proved more rational than he was. The false teachers, like Balaam, are less rational than an irrational jackass, is the point. In this verse, the false teachers are called waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. The false teachers are said to be empty, speaking boastful words, bombastic nonsense that entice with lustful desires of sinful human nature. The victims are the new converts. Verse 19 conveys the empty message with which the false teachers ensnare these new Christians and renders them liable to judgment. That is, that there is going to be no judgment. Jesus is never coming back. Whereas becoming a Christian means escaping corruption in the world, Leaving this state is more tragic than never having escaped the world's corruption in the first place. This assertion is supported by a saying of Jesus concerning the state of one who experiences the return of the unclean spirit that now bring with them seven more. The knowledge of Christ that enables escape from defilements of the world does not prevent one from becoming a slave to those defilements once more. It's worse to turn away from the ray of righteousness than never to have known it at all. The denunciation of the false teachers ends with verse 22. They are like a dog that returns to ingest the impurity of its own vomit and a pig that returns to the mud once it has been scrubbed clean. Dogs and pigs, despised animals in the ancient Near East, were often joined in Proverbs to symbolize the immorality of us Gentiles. Pigs and dogs like those Gentile sinners we've talked about before. All right, we're going to have to stop there. We'll begin with chapter 3, and there are only three chapters, so we're about to finish this second letter of Peter and move on to the letters of John. Don't rush off if you haven't been to church. Our chapel choir is singing for you this morning. Chancel choir at 8.30.